This airplane belongs to Stephen Kale. We call it S&G Airline. Even though it's a small two-seater, this plane has capabilities approaching that of regional jet airliners. This is because of the EFIS installed in this plane. In this video, we're going to show you some of the features of our EFIS. To start off, I want to show you a few pictures. In 1995, I owned this Cherokee Arrow. It was pretty well equipped for the time and had instruments and a layout that was pretty typical for the day. So let's take a look inside. I want to show you the panel that I had back then. So here it is. This plane was set up pretty well for VFR and IFR flight. It had more than the required minimum equipment at the time. So here's the primary flight instruments. You got airspeed indicator, attitude indicator, altimeter, turn coordinator, a gyro compass, and a rate of climb indicator. These were arranged in the standard six-pack configuration. This then is the radio stack. It has dual nav comms, an audio panel, and distance measuring equipment. It takes up the whole center portion of the panel, uh, like you can see there. So over underneath the ADF receiver is the transponder. For any non-pilots out there, this is used by air traffic control to identify and follow the plane when you're under radar control. So for navigation, we have the course deviation indicators that are shown here. And like most other instruments, these are three and a half inch dials and they show the plane's position relative to the desired course. Next, we have the engine instruments, a bunch of those. So we've got a tachometer, manifold pressure gauge, fuel flow, fuel quantity, oil temperature, and oil pressure gauges. And then finally, down in the lower left corner of the panel, we have the autopilot control. Now in this airplane, this was a single axis autopilot, so it could hold a heading or it could track a VOR radio, but it had no altitude control at all. So look again at this panel. Look at all the space this stuff took. This is a standard 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. So I drew a box on this paper, and the box is about the size of an iPad Mini. All the instrumentation that we saw in the Cherokee, well, it fits inside the box shown here. Not only does all that stuff fit here, but there's even more displayed within the box than there was on the Cherokee panel. Let's take a quick flight and capture an image of the EFIS display. So first, we go to for flight application on our iPad and chart out a flight from Jasper, Georgia to Oxford, Mississippi. In the upcoming months, this is a flight we're actually gonna take. So arriving at the airport, we connected our iPad to the EFIS via Bluetooth and transferred the flight plan to the airplane. For this flight, we took off, climbed to 1,000 feet on runway heading, and then engaged the autopilot. The airplane automatically turned to intercept the course, and it continued the climb to 6,500 feet, where it leveled off and accelerated to cruise. All I had to do was monitor the power and just watch out for traffic. So here's our view at 6,500 feet over North Georgia. It was a clear day, unlimited visibility. The air at this altitude was super smooth, and even though we were traveling about 130 miles per hour, there was very little sensation of movement. You'll have to excuse the bugs we picked up on the canopy during the climb because there's just no way to reach out there and wipe them off. And this is what our Garmin G3X touch screens looked like at the time. This one is the pilot's display, and this one is a second screen in front of the co-pilot seat. So let's take a look at them more closely. This is the pilot's display screen. It's configurable, and this is the layout that I prefer. Divided into four main sections, I can see engine, primary flight, navcom, and map displays. So let's break it down. Here are the important engine gauges that you would want to monitor during flight. You want to make sure that all the needles are in the green, or like we said in the Air Force, everything green has a needle in it. This is a touch sensitive screen, sort of like an iPad. So touch the area where the engine dials are, and you can dive deeper into the engine performance gauges. You can look at the exhaust gas temperature of each individual cylinder. You want to see the temps across all cylinders being pretty close together. 
Cylinder heads on this engine are liquid cooled and you can see the coolant temp here too. At the bottom you can see fuel quantity, gallons per hour, and fuel pressure. Now this display has three tabs in it so touching the second tab at the top changes the display to show the health of the electrical system. The main bus is showing 13.8 volts while the battery is showing 0 amps. The battery is used for engine startup until the engine driven alternators take over. They power the bus and the battery recharges and then goes to a zero load. The EFIS backup battery shows a healthy charge of 13.3 volts. So in the event of an alternator failure, the EFIS display will shift to its battery backup until you can land the airplane. There is a fuel tab at the top of the screen that opens the view shown here. This plane holds 20 gallons of fuel when full. There's a mechanical gauge on the tank, and it's the primary way you measure fuel. But if you tell the EFIS how many gallons are in the tank, it will display fuel remaining as the engine runs. I always top the tank off and update this display to show 20 gallons. Here is the primary flight display section. You can change this to show scrolling tapes if you want to, but I like the larger traditional dials instead. I think they're easier to see. We're doing an indicated 105 knots, but because of our density altitude and outside air temperature, our true air speed is 116 knots. Hey, but wait a minute. We have a headwind of 11 knots, so our ground speed is 109 knots. The ground speed is what matters, because it determines when you're going to get there. In my old Cherokee, only the indicated airspeed showed. I had to calculate everything else by hand while flying, but here it's automatically displayed in real time. Now let's talk about the artificial horizon. This has not only information about the airplane's attitude, but it incorporates navigation information as well. When a desired course is entered into the EFIS, the magenta colored boxes appear. The goal is to fly the airplane through those rectangular boxes to get onto and stay on course. Well, because I'm not centered in the rectangle, I know to steer left some to intercept the course. Then there's the compass. With navigation information overlaid on it, it becomes a horizontal situation indicator, or HSI. You can see that the program course set in the box at top right is 275 degrees while the airplane heading is 271 degrees. That four degree difference is needed to get and maintain course. We're a smidge off to the right and we have a left quartering headwind we need to crab into. In my old Cherokee, these two instruments were powered by vacuum spinning a mechanical gyroscope. In this system, the sensors are all solid state with no movable parts more reliable. The altimeter is self-explanatory. In the lower right corner there is a box where you can enter the barometric pressure. In the upper right corner there's a box where you can type in the altitude that you want the autopilot to hold. You might remember how much space the radios took in my older airplane. This is how much space they take up in our RV-12. Now it's true that I do have a remote head that I can use for tuning the radios, but you could also do it from this screen just by touching the frequency and typing the numbers in manually. And if you're going cross country, it's kind of nice to have this information always available at a moment's notice. How far to your next waypoint and what time you're going to get there. The right third of the screen has the moving map display. In contrast to the old days, when you had this huge paper map that you had to unfold in the cockpit, this is all digital and self-contained. You can zoom out to show the entire trip, or you can zoom in to see more detail up close. I zoom in as I get closer to the airport. The circle around the airplane shows you the glide range if the engine should fail. It takes into account the aircraft glide characteristics, the prevailing wind, and your height above the terrain. 
is not radar, but our plane can see and identify other airplanes in the vicinity. Each one of the circles contains the representation of another airplane nearby. I can touch the airplane symbol and the EFIS will display the aircraft type, speed, and altitude. Good for traffic avoidance. In this same space, I can alter the display to show a sectional navigation chart, or I can display the current flight plan route or waypoints. I can subscribe to a service to display the current weather as a radar image. I can display the terrain in my area or any obstacles around me. I can even remove the map display and enlarge the primary flight instruments. I can change the display to look like concentric rings around me and show any aircraft that may pose a conflict. In this video, we've looked at how the EFIS displays data for this particular flight, but there's much more than that. We can go over some other capabilities in a future video. At the start of this episode, I said that our little plane had capabilities approaching those of a regional jet. Well, the jet wins out on IFR and bad weather capabilities, but I hope you'll agree that for a daytime fair weather flight, our plane has it all. I hope you enjoyed our video. We just got a camera and accessories to do some in-flight video production, so that will be coming in future episodes. If you like our stuff, please subscribe and ring the bell. You'll be notified when the next video is posted. You can also find our channel by searching YouTube for RV-12 SNG. And when warmer weather hits Georgia, we will be flying.